Hello and welcome to the Institute of International and European Affairs here in Dublin. My name is Dan O'Brien, Chief Economist at the Institute, and it's a great pleasure to welcome one of the leading economists of his generation and certainly one of the highest profile economists globally, Professor Joe Stiglitz. He'll discuss the future of fiscal policy and I'm sure one or two other issues over the course of the next hour. Um, with such interest in this event, let me get through the formalities quickly so that Joe has as much time as possible to share his thoughts with us. With us. Although he needs little introduction, I list just some of his current roles and past roles by way of introduction. Joseph E. Stiglitz is a professor of economics at New York's Columbia University, co-chair of the high-level expert group on the measurement of economic performance and social progress at the OECD, and the chief economist of the Roosevelt Institute. A recipient of the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Science in 2001 and the John Bates Clark Medal in 1979. He's held a range of roles, including Senior Vice President and Chief Economist of the World Bank and Chair of the US President's Council of Economic Advisors. Um, if you have questions, please submit them via the Zoom Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and identify yourself and your affiliation, please. If you wish to tweet, please use the handle at IIEA. Uh, and with that, uh, Professor, it's a real pleasure and looking forward so much to hearing hearing your thoughts. Over to you. Well, thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. I wish I could be there in person. Um, the subject of uh, my talk uh, uh, today is has to do with the macroeconomic policy, fiscal policy in the aftermath of uh, the pandemic. Um, the pandemic uh, forced governments across the world to borrow at record levels to fund the economic response to the pandemic. Uh, I think those responses were appropriate. They were effective. Uh, the economic downturn that many worried about was uh, greatly diminished from what it otherwise would have been. Uh, the vulnerable were protected. The countries like the United States that had the strongest, even if not the best design uh, responses, had uh, the weakest uh, economic downturns, the strongest recoveries. Um, but now uh, the world faces uh, an important debate regarding the future of economic policy. The question is, what do we uh, do with the high levels of debt? And this is a particularly important uh, in Europe. Uh, the uh, EU now faces uh, an important debate regarding the future of its fiscal rules. Uh, the rules which say that deficits should not exceed 3% uh, or debts 60% uh, of GDP. I should begin by emphasizing that those fiscal rules, part of the Growth and Stability Pact, were never based on economic science. They never made any economic sense. They were drawn out of uh, thin air. Uh, in fact, uh, they were in many ways counterproductive. I sometimes uh, uh, refer to the uh, the growth and stability pact as the non-growth and the instability pact. Um, and what I wanted to do in the, the next few minutes is to describe some of the fundamental flaws with those rules and uh, some alternative ways forward uh, in how to reformulate, for uh, Europe to reformulate uh, those rules. The most obvious uh, example of uh, the flaw in uh, the rules is that they didn't distinguish between investment and consumption. Uh, if a country is borrowing for a vacation, uh, for consumption, that's one thing. But if it's borrowing for investments to enhance its economic growth, to deal with the challenges of climate change, uh, to prevent environmental degradation, that's quite another. But the Europe's fiscal rules didn't make that kind of distinction. 
there have been efforts in many countries to develop what are called capital budgets to clarify uh, what kinds of spending improve a country's future economic potential and what kinds of expenditures simply represent consumption that benefit the current generation, often at the expense of future generations. So this flaw, this fundamental failure to make this distinction between consumption and investment uh, has hampered, has hampered uh, Europe's economic growth uh, and uh, has a number of adverse effects that I'll describe uh, shortly. But the impact is likely to get even greater in the aftermath of uh, the um, pandemic, and especially so if interest rates start to rise, because uh, uh, then servicing previous debt will occupy more and more of the fiscal space, forcing a contraction of investment and thereby forcing uh, a leading to lower economic growth. From a short run macroeconomic point of view, uh, these uh, flawed rules had uh, another adverse effect. De facto, they were pro-cyclical. When an economy went into uh, a downturn, tax revenues uh, go down almost inevitably. But if a country was already near or at the limits, uh, if it already had a 3% deficit, then the country was forced to contract expending. But of course, contracting spending meant that the economy got even weaker. Uh, you know, contractionary uh, policies are, uh, by their very nature, contractionary. And we saw that so clearly in the Euro uh, crisis, where the Troika, uh, the IMF, the ECB, and the European Commission forced the countries in crisis to cut back on their spending, and that deepened the economic downturn, it didn't improve the fiscal balance, and it took years for some of the countries to recover. Uh, Greece still is not back to where it was before uh, the financial, before the Euro crisis. Uh, since Keynes, we've understood that uh, the central tenant of good macroeconomics is countercyclical policies. But Europe's fiscal rules forced pro-cyclical uh, policies upon uh, country after country within Europe. Within the context of the Eurozone, uh, these effects were particularly adverse. When the Eurozone, uh, when the Euro was founded, celebrating now the uh, 20th anniversary. Uh, when the Eurozone was founded, it was recognized that Europe was not what my colleague at uh, Columbia, my late colleague, uh, Robert Mundell called an optimal currency area. Uh, an optimal currency area requires there to be a high level of similarity among countries uh, so that one could share a common monetary and exchange rate policy. The hope was that various European countries would converge together. But unfortunately, the fiscal rules led to divergence rather than convergence. The countries that were afflicted in the Euro crisis by economic downturns had no choice but to cut back on their expenditures, on investment, on healthcare, on education, on uh, uh, 
infrastructure and technology. These were growth expenditures. And so while the countries that were not afflicted by the crisis, countries like Germany could continue to grow, the fiscal rules, the austerity imposed on the crisis countries meant that by and large, their growth was greatly uh, reduced. And that meant that rather than convergence, there was divergence. The weakest countries grew much more slowly than the stronger countries. And that made, of course, the future of Euro uh, less uh, prosperous, uh, less stable. So the growth and stability pact was poorly designed from the start, not based on economic principles. Uh, and it had uh, 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 adverse effects in the short run by being counter -cyclical, pro cyclical rather than counter cyclical. It had adverse effects uh, on the long term by not distinguishing between consumption and investment. And it led to the divergence of the various countries within Europe. Fortunately, in the context of the pandemic, Europe overrode those rules. It paid no attention. One could only imagine the disaster that would have uh, resulted if uh, Europe had stuck uh, by those rules. In the context of the United States, uh, we spent in our uh, various programs to deal with the pandemic some something upwards of 25% of GDP. Uh, the deficit increased uh, enormously, but it was money that was well spent. It protected uh, uh, the most vulnerable. It even succeeded in reducing childhood poverty by almost 50%. Um, if we have, uh, we're, are, are able to continue our spending uh, in programs that President Biden has called Build Back Better, uh, it will lay the foundation for even stronger growth. In fact, uh, um, with our new infrastructure bill and other spending, um, it, uh, the United States is on target for exceeding where we would have been had the pandemic not occurred. There's a more fundamental point uh, that the pandemic has brought out. We face uh, constant uh, shocks. Uh, there are deep uncertainties. We can't predict the big events that affect uh, the economy. Uh, we couldn't predict 9-11, we couldn't predict uh, uh, 2008, uh, we couldn't predict uh, the pandemic, uh, we couldn't predict uh, President Trump. Uh, so there are all these kinds of big events which affect the macro economy that are not predictable. Um, the lack of predictability, the deep uncertainty, uh, have made it clear that the top-down anchors like the 3% uh, fiscal uh, limit on de fiscal deficits of the 60% limit on debt uh, make absolutely no sense. Um, they, uh, the, it, even in a more stable world, uh, as I said before, they were pulled out of thin air. But in the highly unstable world uh, that we live, uh, they particularly make no sense. They are rules that are meant to be broken and rules that are meant to be broken uh, are not of much help. In the aftermath of the pandemic, uh, I wrote a paper with uh, two of my uh, former uh, colleagues uh, in the Clinton administration, uh, Bob Rubin and uh, Peter Orzak. Uh, Bob Rubin had been Secretary of Treasury, I've been the Chairman of Council Economic Advisor, and Peter Orzak uh, uh, was the head of the Office of Management and Budget under uh, President Obama. And uh, while uh, we've been on 
opposite sides of many issue, economic issues uh, over the years, uh, we came to uh, a broad consensus that uh, the kind of rules that Europe uses and uh, that some Americans have advocated make no sense. That in response to the, um, these deep uncertainties, one has to have an alternative framework. And uh, we, in a paper uh, issued by the Peterson Institute, tried to articulate what that framework uh, was. Uh, we pointed out that one can't even predict simple things like what uh, the interest rates are going to be. And we documented uh, the enormous errors of prediction that uh, the leading uh, uh, forecasters had made, uh, even something as simple as the interest rates. So uh, while we live in a world of deep uncertainty, there are certain things that uh, are consistent uh, across uh, economic disturbances. For instance, uh, it is very clear that automatic stabilizers help stabilize the economy. And that recognizing this, we ought to be strengthening these automatic stabilizers. Unfortunately, policy has often weakened those automatic stabilizers. Those are uh, programs that like enhanced unemployment insurance that goes automatically goes into place when the economy goes into a downturn and the unemployment rate uh, goes up. In the context where there are no jobs, uh, the worry about discouraging search uh, makes uh, absolutely no sense. So it, it, it not only protects individuals at a time when that protection becomes particularly valuable, it also means that at those particular moments, the uh, distortionary effects that might be there, uh, and some allege are there, become uh, much attenuated. Uh, the advantage of having strong uh, automatic stabilizers and adjusting other programs uh, within the government to reflect those um, uh, factors that systematic factors that we can predict means that policymakers have greater scope for focusing on the idiosyncratic aspects of any uh, disturbance, any perturbation that the economy faces. Uh, example, again, is provided by the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic was very different from other shocks the economy has experienced. Uh, it was uh, uh, not like a financial crisis that began with uh, the misdeeds or uh, misallocation of finance. Uh, it was not like 9-11. Uh, it had its own distinctive aspects. For instance, it was uh, in many respects the first service sector economic downturn. But by employing automatic stabilizers for those things that we normally uh, would want to do in any case. We would free policymakers for focusing on the distinctive aspects of each particular uh, disturbance. So uh, uh, one of the distinct aspects of, of the pandemic was, as I said, uh, it focused on the service sector, it was focused on health. Uh, our policymakers should not have had to debate whether we extended unemployment insurance, which occupied so much of their time, but rather how do we respond to the special circumstances presented by the pandemic? Well, we are not, the, this kind of broad approach, I think, is a far better approach than the rigid rules that have undermined, uh, that have uh, uh, underlay the growth and, and uh, stability path. Um, in the last few minutes, I want to uh, talk more particularly about the way forward for Europe. As I said, uh, the failure to distinguish between investment and consumption uh, is uh, uh, 
an impediment to Europe's growth. But it's become particularly dangerous uh, as the world faces climate risk, an existential risk that we have to retrofit our economy for. Large investments will be needed. The cost of not making these investments is enormous. But if Europe's hands are tied by the growth and stability pact, it will be make it difficult for them to make those investments. Right? The cost of making those investments will be to sacrifice uh, uh, education or health or other basic uh, social benefits. Um, it will force unnecessary trade-offs. So uh, as we face the challenge of climate change, uh, the growth and stability pact in the aftermath of the pandemic becomes particularly uh, onerous and it's a particular imperative uh, for change. In the short run, what would be of enormous help is a move towards what sometimes called the golden rule, uh, identifying the uh, separating out consumption and investment expenditures and deducting from, um, uh, from uh, the um, uh, fiscal uh, constraints uh, investment uh, expenditures. At the very least, uh, Europe needs to adopt what is sometimes called the green rule, which deducts uh, climate change expenditures. But over the long run, I think there is a need to rethink these basic rules to go more towards the kind of fiscal resilience framework that I've advocated in my work with uh, Orzag and Rubin. Uh, it seems to me that, uh, uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, it's time to recognize that those fiscal rules were drawn out of thin air not based on economic science, made no sense when they were first adopted in the Maastricht agreements and subsequent agreements. And today, 30 years on, they are not helping Europe address the key problems which it faces today. Thank you.